So th thank you, everyone, um, for having, having uh, me here and uh, for your interest and attention in what we're doing. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about OneWeb, which I'll, and I'll give a little bit of the background, because the background's really important to why OneWeb exists, why we're here today, um, and what we're accomplishing. So this, this is an image which shows the mission, right? You really want to have, I found, and in the companies that I've built, that you really want to have a reason for doing it. Not a paycheck, not making some money, and, and not even, I mean, it's good to make money, and then it's also good to have something that you're passionate about, but what if you can make money, be passionate about it, and do big and important things for humanity? In fact, I'll take it and go the other way. Start with do big and important things for humanity. Hopefully, it, you'll be able to do more because it's something you're passionate about, and if it makes money, great. In this case, because we're spending, starting out with $3 billion and then we'll spend about $20 billion, we need to make money because we need to return money to our shareholders. Otherwise, we'll never get the investment. But we always remember our mission. And our mission is enable affordable access for everyone. This is really super critical uh, for humanity. And, and we'll talk a little, I'll talk, show you a little bit about my history. After I had sold my first company, I went to Africa uh, just to connect schools. I just went and started connecting schools. So I started running fiber. I thought fiber was the answer to everything. And uh, ran a lot of fiber. And I realized that trenching is hard. At times, I'd have 3,200 people trenching at one time. And we'd trench 70 kilometers down the road. You'd just see people with shovels. And we'd be trenching in some of the very, the most difficult parts of the world. And uh, this is in the Virunga Mountains, right, in the, uh, common, right where the Congo and Rwanda border is. Uh, and so we, we had to do a lot of work to get the fiber in. But it was slow going. It was expensive. A single strand of fiber breaks a lot, a lot more than you think. You th many people think, oh, fiber is highly reliable. It is if you have many strands coming from many directions and you have redundancy. But when you just have one, you find out how often it breaks. Uh, so I, I built this telecom in Africa to uh, start connecting schools. And from that, ended up putting the first 3G in Africa, the first fiber to the home. And it was all about that passion of connecting kids and seeing how their lives changed and how opportunity became available to them once they could leave the confines of their local environment, right? Once they mentally could reach out to the rest of the world and communicate with other like-minded people who had passions and interests that were similar. And so after building this, I realized one of my big problems was transport. We had lots of people on the internet, but we were going over geosatellites, which were 36,000 kilometers away. And so there was very high latency. So the quality for all the customers was very poor. And it's not fun to be in the business of disappointing people. So had to solve that problem, and that's where I uh, designed O3B Networks, which stands for the other three billion. And conceptually, it was to build a network, build satellites that were closer to the Earth, uh, that they were at 8,000, are at 8,062 and a half kilometers from the Earth versus 36,000 kilometers. So they brought the latency from sort of 700 milliseconds down to 130 milliseconds. Huge improvement in internet speeds for, and, and, and the quality of internet for people. And today it's up and running in uh, over half the Pacific Islands and all over Africa and the Middle East, and it's doing quite well, and I'm very proud of that company. Although uh, since we sold it to SES, I'm no longer a shareholder. But after sort of retiring from O3B, um, I still had this problem, and the problem that over half of the world was without internet access. And this affects all of us. Socially, it's half the world without access to the ideas, the civic entrepreneurship and, and thoughts that we are all able to, 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 to work with in the environment that we're able to work in. Um, financially, it's a market that's good for us to sell to and it could be good for them to, become, to be selling to us. So we basically have half the world that is financially, almost financially irrelevant to us. Now, if we could bring them in 
and make them financially relevant, they'll grow, we'll grow, it'll be good for all of us. It'll be good for them indivi those individually. And actually all the aid that is going in won't be as necessary because they'll be self-sufficient. So I started really thinking about this problem for humanity and what could we do and, and, and how can we solve this and make sure that everybody can have access right to, right to their school was really the first start. But then it grew to become bridge the digital divide for everyone. So if you want to start a satellite company, the first place you go is the ITU. The ITU is, is the manager of all the spectrum of the world. Everything above 100 kilometers is managed by the ITU. And the ITU is under the UN, so there's 200 and some number, 19 maybe, countries that are members of the UN. And every country that's member of the UN is a member of the ITU and has agreed that every, the spectrum above 100 kilometers will be managed by the ITU. And it turned out that there was this frequency available called KU band. And it was a big swath of spectrum that we were able to, to, to use. However, we had to use it in a way that didn't interfere with the geosatellites, the 1,500 geosatellites that were circling the Earth. So we designed a system to unlock that spectrum, to make it available, to provide services to everyone. And it looks a little like this, a lot like this, actually. So you have a gateway where the finger is. There you go. It's sending signal up to the satellite. The satellite sends a signal to the ground. And there's 16 beams in this initial system. And each of those beams, the frequency is changing, just like as you drive, by, drive down the road and you change frequencies from cell tower to cell tower. And we hand over as the satellites go overhead. It doesn't go this fast. So there will be 49 satellites per plane, and you'll see them in a plane, and there's 18 planes initially. So start with frequency, move to a design that makes it work. Then they had to build a satellite, and I wanted the satellites to be $500,000 each. That was the goal. How do you move it from 50 million to 500,000? So it's two orders of magnitude difference, and um, I think that's right. And we, uh, we fi three actually, we had to, we, we figured out how to do that. We pulled together a team, about 35 of us, and we redesigned satellites so that they could be less expensive. They could be mass manufactured. They could be produced with a higher reliability than the satellites that are produced today. And uh, we took that satellite design and we went to a bunch of partners like Airbus and Talus and others, and we said, hey, would you like to joint venture with us? Would you like to take this design and co-manufacture it and put it in volume production? And they said, there's no way you can build a satellite for $500,000 that has 10 gigabits per second of capacity. They dove in, they looked at it, and then they all wanted to invest. Uh, and uh, uh, Airbus became our, is now our third largest investor. So a lot of this does take money. So initially, the design of the satellite we did, it was all self-funded. And then after that, we did our first round, we raised $500 million. We planned for $1.5 billion for the project, uh, to raise $500 the first year, $500 the second year, and $500 the third year. Fortunately, after raising the $500 the first year, we went out to raise the $500 million in the second year, and we ended up raising $1.2 billion. So we exceeded our long-term budgets uh, in, in equity. Um, and we're very fortunate to have uh, Qualcomm as our second largest investor, and they build the chips, actually, that make the satellite work, uh, or make the, the communications work, and then uh, SoftBank as our largest investor. And as I mentioned, Airbus is our third largest investor behind Qualcomm. And together with Airbus, we took this concept of a satellite where we had actually gone out and we had redesigned components, reaction wheels and, and processors and, and, and all the, uh, the, the avionics and, the, and the, the flight hardware, redesigned it to be manufacturable. And then the next part is to, to actually put it together.
connecting and screwing into each of these locations, you'll notice that it, it's actually, it's got this little funny thing on it. It's geolocated, that screwdriver. So it can only put screws in the right places, at the right torque levels. Nobody sets a torque anymore. All the torque levels are done on the screws, geolocated within the satellite, and recorded in our database. So every single screw, every single component is imaged, is tested, is put together, and known for every individual satellite. A lot of innovations in those whole assembly and facility, and how we build our propulsion systems for all electric propulsion, and how every single assembly step is done in an X, Y, or a Z axis. These panels, we had to invent with uh, another company how to put all the little screw holders, they're called inserts, into them. Typically those take 15 minutes each. There's 550 per satellite. So it went from one month of inserts to three hours. So this production facility, we designed with Airbus, we put together. We're gonna be able to build four satellites per day. facility in Florida. Our facility in Toulouse is up and running. So we've gone from idea to spectrum to constellation to satellite itself to raising capital to designing a manufacturing facility to actually building a manufacturing facility. And uh, we're doing a lot of little things, well, with little people too. Um, but we're, we're, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of pieces of the puzzle, like the solar panels. How do you build space solar panels in the volume that we need? It's never been done at this volume. So uh, we're building these, and we're putting them together, and hundreds and hundreds of, of solar panels, thousands of them. Um, and uh, fully automated, uh, I should say semi-automated. The actual, all of the... Um, Things that could go wrong are fully automated, <laughs> pretty much. So when you're screwing something in, it's automated how much torque it has and which screw goes in where. Um, to m everything can only go in one way, and when it's put in, you'll s we also are uh, visually inspecting it piece by piece. This is a picture of our assembly unit for, the, um, for these inserts, which are the little tiny dots you see there. Those inserts are incredibly precise. They have to be uh, flat. They have, inside of those pieces of metal are corrugated aluminum, there are heat pipes, there's, there's uh, a, a lot of glue and other materials in there, and you can't distort them at all when you put these inserts in. Usually they're done by hand, actually, they've never been done by machine. And this was a major step forward in our production facility, one of many. So in Florida, we have a facility now that is, this is a, a little bit older picture, but in January we'll be turning on and it'll be the world's first high volume production facility. So we'll have Toulouse, France, and Florida. Uh, and the uh, one in Florida will be producing at, at, at the four sat up to four satellites per day. So, so now we've got production. So what do we get? Like, what's it do, right? Um, well, we're gonna be getting our throughput well, uh, well in excess of a gigabit per second. So to your home, with latencies below 50 milliseconds so that it's just like your cable modem or fiber to the home. We're gonna have easy terminals that are very simple to install and global availability. So the same internet that you're used to here, maybe even better, will be available to everybody in the world. That everybody across Namibia, Nicaragua, or Panama, or Nigeria will have access to the same quality of internet. And that's the mission, to be able to put a small panel at a house, a church, a school, a home, a community center, a health center, and to have very high speed internet access available at a very low cost. So we're targeting to get to, by 2025, to have a billion subscribers on the network. We'll be doing backhaul for cellular networks. So we're many, there's seven and a half million towers today that are still in 2G, running 2G because they don't have backhaul. So we'll be able to do upgrades of the 2G to 5G. We'll be able to do small cell deployments anywhere. You literally will put it in, a, in, in the road and you'll have connectivity up and down the road. So these are some of the things that we're, we're doing. And um, 
we're growing uh, our constellation from what you saw there. We have several other constellations in process right now that'll be going uh, around those constellations to provide even higher speeds. So we'll get multiple gigabits per second right to the home. And so that's the mission. And uh, that's what we're building. And I can take some questions and, and walk through it, but that's a, a quick overview of OneWeb and the path and journey. Uh, we're launching in March our first 10 satellites. In October, we start launching every 21 days, we'll launch 36 satellites. So we have a multi-year campaign across three launch pads. We have rockets racked and stacked and dispensers in production, all of the pieces of the, uh, uh, in place. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have some of the pictures of our, of our really cool, uh, 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 we're building gateways around the world now. We're putting all the pieces in place for a launch next year with our first customers turning on, hopefully in 2019. And then in 2020, we'll be in broad deployment and uh, hopefully eliminating the digital divide in country after country after country. So with that, I'll take a few questions and then that's it. Greg, fantastic. You brought some of the fascination uh, to the auditorium here. Uh, it's really, it's amazing. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Then I would uh, go for the icebreaker. And, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, sorry? So, someone, oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. So my question is, does the satellites have some inter-satellite links? As far as I understood, there is no satellite interconnection between each satellite? OK. Uh, can you maybe spend some words on the ground terminal? Uh, if you you have you have a Leo constellation, you have your little flat antenna on the roof of the building over there. Is this a actually you need there a steel ball antenna? Is this a, an array antenna, or can you spend there some word on, on the technology there, please? Uh, going in order, so no inner satellite links. And I'm going to come back to your question in a second. No inner satellite links, uh, no onboard processing. Stupid satellites. Stupid is good. <laughs> uh, it's already complex enough. Uh, when you really, at least when we run all the, uh, all the simulations and we do all the math, I, we have not found the reason to go to reach for technology just for technology's sake. You can pay buzzword bingo on technology and say, I've got this, and I got this, I got this. But the real question is, what's the performance, and what's it cost, and when is it available, and what's the reliability? So those are the pieces of things, that, those are the pieces at the bottom that we have to look at. Um, while it would be really cool to have all those other fun things, we'll let DLR do some of them. <laughs> uh, Maybe you want to say something about your ground infrastructure. Okay. Yes. Uh, that, 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 yes. So what we found, so we're building um, uh, ground infrastructure all over the world. and. Um, and we found that we didn't, by doing inter-satellite links, we didn't actually reduce the amount of ground infrastructure. It didn't, didn't materially change anything, but all of a sudden we have a bunch of parts on the satellite, each of which could break. And things go wrong in satellites all the time. And so uh, the, the only way to make sure something doesn't break is to not have it. Uh, so <laughs> coming back to the terminals, um, yes, they're ste fully steerable. They have to be, um, and uh, uh, they're very special what I can say about them right now. <laughs> that, that sounds like something still to be patented on. <laughs> the, the terminals are the most expensive part of the system, by far. They're about 10 times more expensive for the ground terminals than it is for the satellites. So, Thank you. More than yeah. that, actually. Yeah, yesterday, there was your good friend Jan Werner on the stage, that is what he said, and he encouraged the audience to ask you about your plans for space debris mitigation, and he promised that you are very well prepared. So can you <laughs> tell us something on that? Well, <laughs> we'll have to take the good friend, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, Jan's fantastic, and actually I'm, I'm a big fan of the Moon Village and, um, and what that could mean for humanity to work together to do something where you can work individually and together at the same time. Um, and I think that would be a, a wonderful thing. And I, I uh, uh, applaud him for his work on that. Space debris. Um, I've been, you know, you'd think that 
since we announced like a long time ago we were building this constellation and we really started this whole thing, um, uh, you'd think we'd be ducking and hiding from space debris questions. But um, from the beginning, we put a team together to focus on space debris because uh, the sustainable development means doing really good things that don't harm future generations. And it's like super important. Um, and this isn't about making as much money as you can fast because this is, there's a lot of easier ways to make money. Um, this is about doing something that we can all be proud of and we can all participate in to accomplish for, for everyone. Um, so space debris is one of my biggest concerns. Um, we've done a lot of work to make sure our constellation has incredible amounts of reliability, uh, that the satellites come down uh, safely, that they deorbit, that they fully burn up, that they don't drop things through the atmosphere, uh, that they won't hit each other in space. We've done a lot of work on that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, after we came out, you know, a year or two later, all of a sudden everybody, lots of other people said they want to build satellites right where we are. Not there or there, but like right there on us. And it's called overlapping constellations. There's no need for it. There's plenty of space in space to go up in altitude. There's not much space in space horizontally which is a very interesting thing. People think space is big. It's not that big. It takes 90 minutes to 110 minutes to go around the entire world. It's faster to go around the entire world, entire Earth, than it is to drive across Munich. <laughs> so the volumetric use of space by satellites per second is huge. So it's not a very big area that we're working in. And our satellites are relatively uncontrollable. I say relatively because you can kind of control it. And I gave the, the example, I think of like, think of a hippo on ice skates going 15,000 miles an hour and then tell them to turn left. <laughs> it doesn't do that. Not only that issue, but we're not doing chemical propulsion. We're all electric. And all electric is about we have about this much force, the weight of a paperclip on our satellite to make it turn. That's all we have. So if it's going this way, and I've got one paperclip worth of force go that way, let me know a couple weeks in advance and I'll move it out of the way of something. So we have to be very careful about the way we design our satellites, design our constellations. So those are things that we can do individually and we're all over that. But what are governments doing is the question. DLR, you have a voice. What is the DLR doing? What uh, is the FCC doing? What is the ITU doing? What are we all doing to help raise our voices to talk about space debris issues? It sort of seems foreign. It sort of seems like space is big. It's not that big. And there's a lot of constellations which have not been so thoughtfully designed. They were kind of very quickly filed. and. Um, I think DLR has done a quite, uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, research on this, and there's some dangers ahead of us. And the problem is these dangers aren't small, they're big. Uh, does anybody know how long, if we have a little accident up there, how long the space debris will last? Here, guess. Anyone? Before it deorbits from 1,200 kilometers. 2,783 years. Close, but <laughs> like, and so we, we need to be careful about these things. The, 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 the downside is, 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 is large and would harm our vision of sustainable development. So um, we've been very focused ourselves, very, very focused. We feel very comfortable about our reliability numbers, about our capability of managing our own interferences. Um, we wish that other constellations would be 125 kilometers apart from us. Um, uh, Boeing did make the move, uh, which we applaud them for doing so, um, because they were too close. Uh, others, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe governments will tell them to, or maybe they won't. And so that's a very, it's a, it's a hot topic for a few people. <laughs> I wish it was a hot topic for more people. But, um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But thanks for the question, and thank, thank you, Jan, for asking. <laughs>
Um, yes, I have a special question because I'm really interested in, the, in your business plan. Because um, when do you expect a return on invest? I think it's a hard, working in space is a hard job. <laughs> And in this case, very special. Do we have the support of countries, for example, in Africa? Um, yes. Yes. So um, we've got we've been very fortunate to have a lot of support, global support. Um, we have investors from, I think, every continent. Oh, one's missing, but you can figure out which one that is. <laughs> Doesn't have any people. A lot of penguins. Uh, but we, we have, uh, we have support from every continent. We have um, investors from many, many different countries. We have governments involved, uh, uh, very, very uh, 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 interested in our success, in our mutual success. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, our biggest investor uh, includes a number of governments um, uh, from Africa. We've got the government of Rwanda involved. Uh, we've got um, uh, licensing around the world, and we have the priority rights, which allowed licensing to be very smooth and simple. Um, around the world, generally, when I meet with governments, they, they're desperate for a solution. If you're, in the U if you're in Europe, you're desperate for the last 10%. You just can't get there. One, uh, they'll remain nameless, but one European major telco said, the government's pressuring me to connect the last 5%. It cost me more to run a cable to these houses than the house is worth. So that, they're, des they're desperate for an answer. So there are partners in our friends. Um, we've mapped out the business model, and it's, it's quite strong. Um, it's a very, very large amount of cash up front. Uh, you have to have uh, very high risk tolerant investors. And you have to demonstrate uh, prudence um, and uh, a strong ethical uh, commitment to accomplishing this long-term goal. And uh, we're very, very fortunate to have the investor base that we do. So the business model is good. Um, we think we can hit uh, extremely low cost. Uh, we're bringing extremely low cost internet um, to the world. I mean, our cost per home of bringing internet will be much less than any cable, cable or fiber of the home provider with a higher quality than they, they can provide. So it's, it's going to be a superior service, although most people think of it as an inferior because that's where satellite's been. But where satellite's going, it gives you the same or better quality than any fiber or cable operator mm -hmm. with no restriction on, uh, on footprint. So every home, everywhere. So uh, we feel good about the business model. And uh, uh, although we're very, very focused on bringing very high quality access to the poorest people of the world, we're still going to do that profitably. We're still going to drive the, our costs down so low that they can afford it. And it's good for everyone. Maybe, so thank sorry, you. Maybe, maybe I, I can just ask you a question. Uh, and uh, this is about. Uh, the trade-off between uh, quality and, and capacity. I mean, at a certain stage, you're going. To, if you have a you have big success, then the quality will go, go down because there will be not enough uh, bandwidth available for all those customers. Where do you expect this to happen first? Do you have an idea? It, it will be um, a constant battle, and hopefully, we're going to be in the front of it. Uh, uh, we think we have a plan to get ourselves to a petabit per second by 2025, which will be, give us enough capacity for a billion subscribers with a, a quality of service that they can watch all the 4K video they want all day and leave it on and go to the store. We won't care. Do you know what, what, what is required actually to cover all those people who are not yet connected to a, to a, um, uh, to a fiber? And even if you want to, to I mean, you, you make an adver uh, advertisement which uh, says, okay, I mean, even if I'm connected, maybe I want to go through your system, yeah? And uh, so <laughs> you're going to have a rush. So do you know roughly what? Well, so we have a, we have a yes. What are most people needing? I mean, half of the uh, world's population. Um, what do you we basically need to get to about a petabit per second. Petabit per second? Yes. Petabit per second. What system do you need? I mean, 
it's not going to be one way as it's going to be as you, it's not going to be what you know of today yeah. we have a lot of plans and a lot of things going on that haven't been announced um that will come over time and we'll announce them but will drive us uh substantially to substantially higher uh, amounts of capacity than you're seeing from what is seen to be as a big system but is actually a relatively small system the first system is about seven gigabits per second and uh, terabits excuse me seven terabits per second all the satellites today are maybe a terabit and a half or something so it's many times larger than all the satellites but we'll be stair-stepping that uh with another about 120 terabits per second uh soon and then stair stepping from there so we have major advances coming um but this is the beginning of um, hopefully a journey that we'll all take together and, and with many countries and many people to, uh, to bridge the digital divide. It's not gonna happen with just this phase one, but it'll be a good start. <laughs> so, thank you. you, you have to go. Oh, I, I do have to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Greg, thank you very, very much again. And uh, we give you a very warm applause.